Every year, Thailand exports in the region of one and a quarter million snakes. Most of these go to Hong Kong and Taiwan to satisfy the traditional Chinese desire for snake meat dishes during the winter season. Although this trade does include some rare species of snake, such as the reticulate python or the king cobra, the main market is for the common cobra. During the wet planting season, each rice paddy may contain a hundred or more cobra. The capture and sale of these snakes provides a useful additional income for the poor peasant farms of Thailand. They are happy to have an incentive to remove one of the hazards of growing rice. But the trade in cobra has been so great in recent years that they have become relatively scarce in parts of the country. As their numbers have decreased, there has been a corresponding increase in the number of rats, which are the cobra's usual prey. The farmers never thought they would be sorry to see the last of the cobra, but now they're losing more money in grain lost to the rat than they make from the sale of the snakes. Each morning, Lumpini Park in the center of Bangkok is a focus for exercise and sporting activity. After jogging or Tai Chi, there is a health-giving elixir on sale from stalls beside the park gates, a concoction made by mixing the blood and the gall of a snake with whiskey and honey to make it more palatable. To be effective, the blood and the gall must be removed from the living snake, trapped by a noose round its neck, and held down at the tail by the stallholder's assistance. Cobras sell for about five or six dollars, but the customer who wants something special might order a large reticulate python. This costs as much as thirty or forty dollars, but is considered to be that much more effective. The skin is peeled from the still writhing snake and cut away from the body so that the head is still attached. The meat is given to the customer or sold to a restaurant and the skins are later salted for sale to a tannery or a local taxidermist. ขายกินเลยงูด้วยก็ซุปด้วยกินหายเลยกินตะวันแรกก็หายล่ะหายแล้วลงโรงพยาบาลหาหมอหลายหมอไหนก็กินมามีหายอ่ะกินตะวันน
หามือหามขาเสียคนเลยเอาของหน้าวันที่ไม่ต้องอ่ะสบายแล้วเดินเที่ยวได้สบายเลยแค่นี้ At a conservative estimate, the number of reptiles killed each year, primarily for their skins, is in the region of 10 million. These figures do not take into account the illegal or undeclared trade. In the workshops of Southeast Asia, the skins are fashioned into shoes and handbags, belts and watch straps, and even full-length designer coats made from cobra skin. Because of international controls in the trade in live animals, many of the world zoos have been forced to breed their animals in captivity, rather than buy wild-caught specimens from dealers. But it takes some years for a snake to reach a mature size, so there is always a ready market for a large python taken from the wild. There are many dealers in live animals operating out of Bangkok who will pay a good price for a rare animal or a large specimen. Although the vast majority of snakes are killed to supply the fashion trade, stuffed reptiles are always a popular item in the markets and souvenir shops of the developing world. The expansion of international business and tourism has increased the trade still further, and despite legislation and a growing public awareness of conservation, snakes' head belt buckles and stuffed cobras are still popular souvenirs. Every species of animal which is threatened or endangered is protected by the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species, known by its acronym CITES. CITES was introduced in 1975, and since then it has been ratified by nearly 100 countries. The intention is to prohibit or control the trade both in live animals and in any products which are derived from them. What is this? From uh, Indonesia. Good. How, how did you get it? Uh, cement. All from the cement. Uh. Cement bring here. It's expensive? Not so expensive now. About 200 Singapore dollars now. For CITES to be effective, it depends on international cooperation and strict enforcement by the individual member countries. All big cats are on CITES Appendix 1, which is a list of the world's most endangered species. So the Sumatran tiger or the clouded leopard from Malaysia are both protected by those countries' laws and trading in them is prohibited internationally. But many countries have still not ratified the convention and there are members who are corrupt or inefficient in their wildlife management. So small spotted cats and even leopard and cheetah are traded internationally and used extensively by the fur trade. Taxidermists all over the world have a ready market in stuffed animals and operate quite openly. Every species of bird of paradise is protected by CITES. They are rare, occurring only in Papua New Guinea and some neighboring islands. They are delicate birds, difficult to trap and to keep alive. So there is only a limited trade in live birds, mostly to Tokyo and Singapore, where they sell for thousands of dollars each. A much greater traffic exists in the dead carcasses, shot by natives of the islands and smuggled by Indonesian or Japanese seamen. In their dried state, they can be easily packed away in a bag and slipped through customs and sold to one of the taxidermists who operate throughout Southeast Asia. I, one year I can collect 50 pieces, I think. Only this thing, this, this one. <coughs> this one, many. More many. This one, more many. 200, 300? Yeah, can, can collect. Two or three hundred can. They're all from cement. Cement easy, huh? Easy to carry. Singapore coming very easy. The rarer the animal, the more prized the trophy, and the greater the threat to its survival. 
There are between five and 800 Sumatran tigers left in the wild. Each year, up to 200 are killed for their skins. Wrapped in plain brown paper, they are shipped abroad at a cost of 1,000 pounds. Not a great price to pay for the king of the jungle. Each part of the animal has a value in the marketplace. The skull may be decorated and used as an ashtray. The bones are used for medicinal purposes. Even the teeth and claws have decorative possibilities. The reality of the tiger's death is a remote event in another world. The tiger is already dead, so why be sentimental about its teeth or its skin? But it is the existence of the market which prompts the hunter to pull the trigger. A tiger or a bird of paradise is worth no more to him than someone somewhere is prepared to pay. To an undiscerning eye, this carved tiger may represent a fine example of Asian craftsmanship. The fact that it has been made from a real tiger's tooth only adds to its value and originality. It is not just the tiger which suffers such indignity and death. The skull of a bear, hunted primarily for its meat, for its skin and for its gallbladder, can be turned into a decorative ornament. The ingenuity of the craftsman can turn an elephant's foot into an umbrella stand or monkey skulls into an unusual lampshade. Thailand has a tradition of fine ivory carving, but in recent years, this has degenerated to producing beads and bracelets or tacky mementos for tourists to convince themselves they had a good time in Bangkok. Ivory carving has a long history. The most ancient carved ivory objects from Europe date back many thousands of years, and ivory was one of the first materials used for carving in the oldest cultures of India and Southeast Asia. Originally, these would have been religious objects or the property of the rich and powerful. Because of its value, raw ivory came to be hoarded and traded as a stable commodity, like gold or precious stones. Its value as a commodity has always been determined by its rarity. As new markets began to open up in Europe, the Europeans themselves were developing their own ivory carving styles. With the industrialization of the 19th century, the demand for ivory escalated. World trade was primarily in the hands of European, especially English dealers, and it was not until the Second World War that this situation changed. First India, then Hong Kong and Japan expanded their ivory carving industries, so that today, three quarters of the world's demand for ivory comes from Hong Kong and Japan. Most of the ivory crafted in Japanese workshops is for home consumption, and their craftsmen have developed a rare skill in the carving of exquisite figurines. But fully half of the ivory used in Japan goes into the making of small individual seals which are used in the place of signatures. Europeans are still active in the wholesale trade of African ivory, although the ivory carving tradition in most European countries has died out. One of the few places in which that tradition survives in a small way is in the town of Erbach near Frankfurt in West Germany. The Guild of Ivory Craftsmen was founded in 1783 by Count Franz of Erbach, who learned to carve ivory in Italy and passed his skills on to his subjects. These skills survive today amongst a small group of craft workers who still live and work in Erbach. Bernhard Roch is one of those who is fighting to keep this tradition alive.
Also aus den Tausenden von Elfenbeinverarbeitern, die auch wirklich vom Elfenbein abhängig waren, weil sie ihre Familien damit ernähren mussten, da gibt es heute vielleicht noch 50, die mit Elfenbein arbeiten. Also ich sage, der Elfenbeinschnitzer ist in Deutschland in Anhang 1 der Artenschutzliste zu führen. Der ist stark vom Aussterben bedroht, während der Elefant in Afrika ja in seinem Bestand gefährdet ist, aber nicht vom Aussterben bedroht. Circa 500 Tonnen Rohelfenwein war letztes Jahr der Weltverbrauch. Nach unseren Informationen, die also von der Seite stammen, und äh, verbraucht wurde in Erbach-Rohmaterial ca. 12 Tonnen. Ich möchte heute sagen, dass Elfenbein einfach zu schade ist, um es als Massenware zu zerhackstückeln und äh, zu kleinen Souvenirartikeln zu verarbeiten. Material wird für in großen Mengen verarbeitet, wenn es sehr kleine äh, Produkte daraus gemacht werden. Aber eine Schnitzerei oder auch äh, ein schöner äh, Handschmeichler oder sowas äh, mit viel Liebe auch entstanden, der äh, wird also der Elefant nicht gefährdet im Überleben. Es gibt ja Leute, die meinen, mir aus Erbach würde in Afrika die Elefanten wildern und heimlich über die Grenze schaffen oder so. Da gibt es eine ganze Menge von Ärgernissen. Wenn beispielsweise schon auf der Titelseite als Überschrift steht, blutiges Handwerk in Deutschland, die Elfenbeinschnitzer. Das ist doch schon sehr tendenziös. Aber wir haben ein sehr, sehr hohes Interesse, dass der Elefant noch lang überlebt. Man kann heute behaupten, dass es mehr als eine Million Elefanten noch in Afrika gibt. Aber auch der Elefant kann in seinem Bestand in Afrika nur gesichert werden, wenn ihm das entsprechende Land zur Verfügung gestellt wird, auf dem er auch ungestört leben kann, fressen kann. Und ich glaube, dass man da nur zum Erfolg kommt, wenn in Afrika auf die Regierungen eingewirkt wird, eine gute Naturschutzpolitik zu betreiben. Throughout most of Africa, inadequate wildlife management has allowed the illegal ivory trade to flourish, resulting in the decimation of the elephant population across vast areas of the continent. But because of the long tradition of ivory carving and its importance to many cultures, most conservationists, like Esmond Bradley Martin, would argue in favor of a continuing controlled trade in raw ivory rather than an outright ban. Up until the 1970s, uh, there was not uh, very extensive international controls on ivory. Obviously, individual countries had control, but the importing countries in Asia had very few controls indeed. The new CITES quota system has just started this year, and each country in Africa which has elephants and wants a trade will put in a quota for the number of tusks each country wants to see exported. And of course, in Asia, there's no legal trade in Asian ivory, so it's only African countries. Then these tusks will be numbered and the information will be sent to the CITES Secretariat in Lausanne. And uh, when a country wants to export some ivory, for instance, to Japan or Hong Kong, which take approximately 70% of all the raw ivory in the world, um, these numbers will be sent both to the CITES Secretariat and to the uh, importing country. And this will make it more difficult for illegal ivory to move out. The crooks of the poaching problem in Africa with rhinos and elephants is not the poachers. You could eliminate every single poacher today and there'd be another batch coming in tomorrow. The important thing to understand are the traders. And the big traders in ivory are extremely few indeed. There are only a handful in Asia and a handful in Africa. And if you can control them or put them out of business, that is the method to stop the illegal trade of the animals. There's no point of going after all the poachers. There are just too many of them. They're in the tens of thousands all over the continent. And they'll switch out of one business into another business. But the traders themselves, they have the expertise of how to get the ivory out of the African continent. They know that it has to go to Singapore, or they know it has to go to Hong Kong and Japan. No poacher has any of that kind of information. The traders also have access to transport, access to bribing government officials, etc. We must remember that the entire ivory quota system is based upon honesty of licensing officers. And um, 
also on reasonable data on the number of elephants within the countries. We have a minimum of 700,000 elephants in Africa, and certain African countries make a great deal of money out of the legal trade. It's regular culling, legal killing of elephants going on in Zimbabwe, Namibia, and South Africa. And this is because there's very good management in those countries, and there's just a surplus of elephants. In other words, the carrying capacity is way in excess of what the land can have. And these countries should be able to sell their ivory internationally. I mean, elephants are no different from cattle uh, if they're properly managed. I think the emphasis should go into those countries which are mismanaging their elephant populations, such as Zambia and the Central African Republic, Uganda, and some others. These countries are mismanaging most of their uh, natural resources. Many countries are doing that when they're in poor economic condition. So if you outlaw the ivory trade, it's not practical, it wouldn't work, and um, it would penalize some countries that are managing their resources very well. And if we have 750,000 elephants, there's no way we can say that they're in danger and going to disappear. They're not. The protection and conservation of large mammals, such as the rhino or the elephant, are issues over which it is possible to create a wide public awareness. There are many individuals and organizations which devote their time and energy and money to nothing else. It's more difficult to concern the public about less immediately attractive animals, such as the South American iguana. During the breeding season, each female iguana produces about 40 or 50 eggs. These are lightly boiled and strung together to be sold in the market of Cartagena. The animals are released after their wounds have been sewn up, in the belief that they will produce more eggs the next year. It is more likely that they will die of infection or in their weakened state fall prey to some scavenging dog. Even if they do survive, the chances are they will be sterile. Pero por el momento no me estoy trabajando ahora porque estoy varado, no hay. Estoy trabajando ahora. Yo no estoy haciendo nada más con iguana por ahí para no estar aburrido aquí en el pueblo y se va una bola iguana. De ahí bastante podemos coger uno 15, 18, 20. Donde no haya, por ejemplo, como ahora cogemos 5, 3, 4, así. Después que nosotros cuando la cogamos, nos la traemos y la capamos. Cuando ya la capamos, cogemos los hongos, sangollamos los huevos. Cuando cogemos bastante, lo vendemos, los huevos. Estoy metiendo, la cocemos y la soltamos. Iguana eggs are a popular delicacy with Latin American people, and the opportunity of selling them in the market means a little extra income in an area of high unemployment. Although the practice of taking and selling the eggs is against the law in Colombia, they are sold openly in the markets of the big towns under the noses of passing policemen. Si hubiera prohibido, 
no se vendiera públicamente. Si las autoridades pasan por aquí y ven la venta, es legal. Because turtles are hunted at sea and generally lay their eggs on remote beaches, it is difficult for wildlife protection agencies in the developing world to control the trade in their products. Even in the United States, with all the resources of the relatively well-funded Fish and Wildlife Service, it is hard to protect the turtles against dedicated egg poachers. Undercover agents of the service have to resort to unusual tactics to infiltrate the illegal trade and defend this stretch of Florida's coastline. I'm Terry English. I'm a special agent with the United States Department of Interior, Fish and Wildlife Service, Division of Law Enforcement. This stretch of beach that we're working tonight is undoubtedly the most poached beach for turtle eggs in the United States. We first started working this area in 1979. When we first became involved, we were working it from an undercover standpoint, where we infiltrated a small community of people that have been notorious for poaching eggs from this area of the beach for generations. We developed our, our cover front uh, to where I was a rich uh, playboy. My father owned three restaurants in uh, Georgia and Florida. And my partner and I were just uh, travel around making contacts for the restaurant business. We worked it on undercover for a period of about two to three years. And during that time, we were able to document over 300,000 eggs being taken per season at 50 cents an egg. When we first started out, we learned that we had approximately 25 suspects. As of today, we have apprehended 21 of those, with three of them being repeat offenders. When the turtle has laid her eggs, she returns to the sea and will play no further part in the rearing of her young. When the baby turtles hatch a couple of months later, they will make their way to the sea on their own. It is reckoned that in a natural environment, even without man's interference, only one turtle in 5,000 will reach maturity. On this Florida beach, they face an added hazard. Tourism has spread along this unprotected stretch of the coast and the area is being developed with roads, hotels, and condominiums. The baby turtles are normally guided to the sea by the lighter color of the waves breaking on the shore. With so many other lights to distract them, they're now more likely to try to cross the road to the Holiday Inn. Turtles always lay their eggs by night, and a skilled poacher can recognize the nest by the turtle's tracks. Each nest will contain up to 100 eggs, and at 50 cents each, can earn the poacher several thousand dollars over a season with little risk of being caught. This is a night scope that a lot of law enforcement agencies worldwide have found to be a very useful and valuable tool. It enables a law enforcement officer to be able to detect individuals or movement of any suspicious nature at night without being detected by the criminal. 
Although the eggs in this case may have been laid under the watchful eyes of the Fish and Wildlife Service, the turtles' problems are not over. Their meat is much in demand for expensive gourmet soup, and the shell is highly prized for luxury goods and accessories. All marine turtles are listed on CITES Appendix 1, but such is the beauty and the value of the shell that they are widely hunted throughout the tropics. Due to the low political priority given to conservation and the general lack of public awareness in the developing world, the trade in shell continues to flourish. In Colombia, the Institute for Natural Resources, Indirena, has occasional successes in their struggle to control this trade. Se le pone, se le pone pergamino encima, ¿no? En placas y se pinta como, como pared y encima se le echa, se le echa resina. Aquí lo que estamos usando no son los, es decir, esto es pergamino, es que esto es, esto es um, cacho, cacho y se pinta la forma de carey. Este, este es Karey, hace 15 años. Eh. Este es pues, el que se puede tener This wardrobe carried a 5,000 pound price tag. Even in a poor country like Colombia, there is a market for such extravagant luxury items amongst the wealthy elite. Both the customers for these goods and the individuals who control the lucrative trade in turtle shell generally have the political connections and the wealth to avoid confiscation or prosecution. Indorena have no police powers of entry or arrest. So it is hard for their investigation division, led by Ricardo Martinez, to make such a confiscation stick. Aquí tenemos unos productos que fueron decomisados en un almacén típico de un sector comercial de Bogotá. La razón del decomiso es en razón a que estas son incrustaciones de la tortuga carey, especie que no solamente está en vía de extinción, sino que a nivel de Colombia se encuentra de su aprovechamiento desde el año 74. Existe personal de alta influencia, puede ser socioeconómica, política y desafortunadamente a veces en esos casos es un poco más difícil entrar a detectar y se le dificulta un poco más la acción del instituto porque de antemano se sobreentiende que una persona con solvencia económica tiene los elementos necesarios para tratar de evadir. Lo que hay en muchas oportunidades no sucede con el pequeño. El instituto no dispone de los recursos humanos y económicos suficientes para tener una infraestructura que en cierta forma le permita establecer una serie de controles en los sitios críticos y áreas importantes. Apart from the illegal commercial trade, one of the biggest problems facing wildlife protection agencies is posed by tourists and businessmen attempting to smuggle products from endangered species through customs. At New York's Kennedy Airport, the Fish and Wildlife Service has a warehouse full of such products. Turtle shells is one of our biggest problems. Uh, as you can see, we have literally thousands of shells throughout the, our seizure room here. Uh, the scenario generally with the turtle shells is people going abroad, whether it be on business or pleasure, and uh, purchasing these shells from the natives on the beach, in curio shops or whatever. Uh, generally, a lot of the shells are taken illegally. Now you come in, I take your turtle shell. Now you're a little pissed off at Fish and Wildlife, but you're at a party and some, some other people are going abroad. Oh, you're going uh, to Curacao where I went? Well, listen, there's this native on a corner there on the beach. Don't buy a shell from him because I got beat from Fish and Wildlife. I brought something in that I shouldn't have. And the word gets out, you know, whether it be by us or by, you know, you being disgusted that you lost a shell you paid $50 for. The items confiscated from passengers are only a small proportion of the total amount which is successfully smuggled past customs. Some may be bought in all innocence, but many more are purchased in the awareness that the animals are endangered. Some of these products are so valuable that it is worth employing couriers or mules to transport them in large quantities on a regular basis.
Well, what we have here, all of these suitcases contain rhino horn uh, pills. Now, these are aphrodisiacs that were brought in from various countries in the Orient, as well as Korea. Uh, what happens is that they'll literally stuff their suitcases full with these pills here and attempt them to smuggle them in past customs and Fish and Wildlife Service. These are people who go in and out of the country uh, more or less muling this stuff in and out. They'll bring it into the city or various other locations throughout the country uh, to sell it. Here there is approximately uh, 50,000 or so. Each suitcase contains, I'd say, about 1,000 pills apiece. And, and this seizure would represent maybe about maybe eight months or so. So this is a, an ongoing problem with us. This scenario goes where you get the old oriental gentleman or the old oriental woman uh, literally holding on to them, bringing them in, claiming their old clothes uh, or, or gifts for the family. And then, of course, upon inspection, uh, this is what we come up against. Pressure from Western conservationists has persuaded most Far East countries, including Singapore, to ban the import and sale of rhino products. But more than half of the rhino horn sold in the world today finds its way to the Far East to be used in traditional Chinese medicines. It is a popular myth amongst Westerners that the Chinese use rhino horn as an aphrodisiac. But although they certainly do use many other animal products, such as tiger's penis, as sexual stimulants, there is no record of rhino horn ever having been used for this purpose. The tradition of using animal products in Asian pharmacology is thousands of years old, and rhino horn is still prescribed according to medical guides written centuries ago. Yangchenpa 这个是熔胆这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是这个是
And uh, what, what's been happening is that whole populations have been uh, eliminated in many African countries. And the problem simply is that uh, in many of the countries where rhinos live, uh, the economies of these countries uh, are mismanaged and some are in an outright shambles. So what's happening is that people are killing rhinos to externalize an asset. In other words, they're going to kill a rhino or an elephant to move a product out of the country, which they can earn a hard foreign convertible currency. And even if the price of rhino horn went down by 50% tomorrow, these same people would still be trying to kill the rhino because some money out of the country is better than nothing. So it's pretty dismal for the black rhino. As far as the white rhino in Africa is concerned, the ones that live um, in the northern part, in other words, the northern race of the white rhino, uh, we had several thousand perhaps uh, in 1970, and now we're probably under 30. So the future for those few rhinos is, is very poor. They've probably been totally exterminated in, in places like Uganda and uh, Sudan and Chad as well in the Central African Republic. The main places in Africa today where the horn is going out of are Burundi, Khartoum, Zambia, and probably Djibouti. And what happens is that the poachers go into the field in various countries where there are a reasonable amount of rhinos, such as Zimbabwe and Tanzania and perhaps Zambia as well. The best known poaching that's going on now are Zambians crossing the Zambezi Valley into Zimbabwe, where they've killed over 100 rhinos now. And they perhaps get 25 to 33 percent. And then it goes into a town somewhere. Most of the uh, horn that comes out of Zimbabwe moves northwards into Zambia and from Zambia it goes up to a little port called Impulungu on Lake Tanganyika and from there it goes up into Burundi. That's exactly how it moves out and there are probably two or three traders involved in that actual movement and then from Bujumbura which is the capital of Burundi it will be then flown out to the Middle East. Much of the horn leaving Africa is transshipped via the United Arab Emirates. Most of this goes to North Yemen for carving into handles for the Jambiyas, the prized daggers worn by Yemeni men as a sign of wealth and prestige. Historically, rhino horn was so rare and so valuable that only the very rich could afford it. But in recent years, many Yemenis have found new wealth as a result of the oil boom in the region. Although the handles are often made of other materials, such as water buffalo horn, it is rhino horn with its amber glow, which is considered the most precious. Although the importation of the horn was technically banned in North Yemen a few years ago, this area is famous for its trade in contraband, and so daggers with rhino horn handles are openly crafted and displayed in the souk, the central market in the capital, Sana'a. If the demand for rhino horn from North Yemen alone were met, it would account for the death of 7,000 rhinos each year. Many conservationists feel that the only chance for the survival of the rhino lies in armed protection within guarded reserves. It has even been seriously proposed that all the rhinos left in Africa should be transplanted to Texas for their own protection. In Kenya, as in most of Africa, the rhino population continues to decline. Nearly half of the rhino which have survived the slaughter of recent years are concentrated onto private ranches. Their survival depends upon well-intentioned individuals with enough money to indulge their eccentric whims. Anamurt's rhino reserve cost half a million pounds to set up. It houses a dozen black rhinos and one white rhino. I set it up because I had some money to spare and the rhinos have been terribly clobbered in Kenya and I thought something should be done about them. And um, the whole idea is that the rhinos should breed in absolutely natural conditions in their own natural habitat. And then if we ever get to the stage of having an excess number of rhinos, they can be put back into the parks, or they can be released into the north of Kenya where there used to be tens of thousands of rhinos and now they're virtually none. The reasons for keeping them in a high security area with all the fence and the electronic monitoring system and guards and everything is because the price of rhino horn is greater than the price of gold 
And so the incentive to poach them has meant that 99% of the population of rhino, black rhino in Africa have been decimated within the last 20 years. You can't stop them poaching. You can't stop them getting through the fence, but my God, we'd shoot a few as they came through. That's why we have to have all the security, why it's such an expensive operation, why we have to have day and night security and an electronic monitoring system and guards on night duty. and butterfly wings raised to the power ten then lemurs and rhinos are just some footnote in a forgotten study somebody wrote but their passing is no mystery they're being stolen they're passing it's no mystery they're being stolen <laughs> 